It's not that a slow metabolism causes you to gain body fat and gain weight. It's the other way around. When you gain excess body fat, it crushes your metabolism. It prevents your hardwired uh, operating system from working the way it's supposed to be. What that means is actually good news when it comes to controlling this obesity epidemic is that it means that our metabolism and our, and our body fat and obesity isn't simply our fate, that we actually can try to fight this excess body fat, find a way to right size it, tame it, in order to be able to unleash our inner metabolism. Hey everyone, what if I told you that 60 was the new 20? Well, when you take a look at the new science of metabolism, it's actually not so far-fetched. As Dr. William Lee tells me in this episode, your metabolism remains stable from age 20 all the way to age 60, and you can control how it works during that time frame. So what does this mean? It means you are not born with slow or fast metabolism. Your metabolism and body fat is not your fate. Dr. Lee is a world-renowned physician, scientist, and New York Times best-selling author. And in today's show, he explains all the new research he's learning about optimizing metabolism and body fat. And let me tell you, his findings are fascinating. William, welcome back. So good to see you and congrats on the book. Thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be back. So I really enjoyed Eat to Beat Your Diet. Uh, I think it is so fascinating and a great sequel to Eat to Beat Disease. Uh, with all that said, you've been on the show previously, but for those not familiar, maybe start by giving a bit about your background, your training, and the work you do. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a physician, uh, internal medicine by training, which means that I take care of men and women, young and old, healthy and sick. And as a physician, my um, my orientation has always been on wellness and preserving health. Um, and I'm also a research scientist. I'm what is known as a vascular biologist. Been doing that for 30 years which means I'm in a lab and I'm in a clinic actually studying our circulation, blood vessels. Um, blood vessels being incredibly important because they're the highways and byways for the oxygen we breathe and the, and the nutrients that we actually eat to deliver them to cells and organs in our body. And I'm also an author. Uh, I wrote, uh, my first book was Eat to Beat Disease, which became a New York Times bestseller. My new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is exactly as you say, a sequel and the reason I started to really write these books for the public as somebody who has been deeply, uh, you know, like a mile deep into the science is because I realized that um, although I've been involved with more than 40 FDA approved new treatments, biotechnologies for cancer, diabetes, and actually preventing vision loss, one of the biggest uh, problems that I saw was that we weren't preventing the disease in the first place. Uh, the key thing about pr uh, prevention really is that you can't be talking about drugs and you can't be talking about um, uh, uh, things that are not accessible, uh, that are expensive and that kind of side effects. And that's what led me to consider how can foods be used as a, a tool in a toolbox? And remarkably, in the, uh, in the annals of human medicine, I'm a doctor, we have before pharmaceuticals always actually had uh, pharmaceuticals, I mean, uh, we only recently had pharmaceuticals. We always had food as tools in our toolbox. And somehow in the last hundred years, we seem to have lost our connections to the roots of how food uh, impacts our well-being and our health. So that's really where I come from. And one of the things I really enjoyed about the book is diving into the science of body fat. You know, it gets into the to the why of this book. 40% of Americans are obese being metabolically unhealthy, which 88% of us are, only 12% of us are metabolically healthy, leads to all sorts of health issues. And in the science of body fat, this goes beyond vanity. I, th I think what's so interesting is this idea of, of fat and how it's related to health and disease at blood vessels, circulation. So maybe maybe go there. The, the science of body fat, because look, we all want to look good. I think we all want less body fat to some degree. But beyond vanity, lots of reasons why. I, I will tell you, when I got done writing my first book, 
my publisher came back to me and said, what are you going to write for your next book? And I said, you know, I, I really compressed 30 years of my research into my first book. And I'm a scientist. I'm continuing to actually do more work in research. Um, I need to be able to write about something that that is truly fascinating to me and something that I um, in actually I, I'm diving into. Uh, the suggestion was like they threw all kinds of suggestions at me. Like, what about a, a cookbook? Well, you know, I... I'm interested. I, I like to cook, so I do like recipes, but I thought, you know, I don't really have the bandwidth to write a cookbook at this time. And then they said, well, what about a diet book? Everyone loves a diet book. And I reacted actually quite strongly to that because I, I'm not a fan of diets. I don't like fad diets or trend diets or crash diets and extreme diets. It's not something that I've ever resonated with. I don't use those myself. And I've treated many patients who are on them and who are incredibly frustrated with sort of the temporary results. Um, they're frustrated with the extremeness of some of these diets. And a lot of them just kind of actually have this boomerang effect where they wind up actually uh, uh, bouncing back, yo-yoing back to a point where they were actually worse off than before. So I always considered um, uh, diets sort of something that is not on my radar. However, look, I'm, I'm human as well. Uh, and I'll tell you how I came to write this book and we can then dive into exactly what you're talking about, the new science of the metabolism and the science of body fat. I'm human. And so like everyone else, I'm sure watching and listening is that, um, you know, you get up in the morning, you take a shower, you step out and out of the corner of your eye, you look in the mirror, you see the mirror and there's always some lumps or bumps or shaped curves that, that didn't, weren't there before. Right. And so that's typical. I think we always kind of um, associate our fitness um, uh, and our health with with vanity, like what we see. Then typically, you, then you step on the scale and if the number that comes up isn't what you were hoping it is, you feel disappointed. So again, you know, this immediate kind of connection between vanity, what we see, uh, what, what who we aspire to be, and then the numbers instantly kind of, uh, kind of almost... Uh, uh, brainwash us into thinking about body fat as something really, really bad, something that we don't want. We want to get rid of it. No matter what your body size is, I think most people, as you pointed out, um, have that kind of feeling. Well, uh, me too. Uh, and I began thinking about and diving into the research of body fat saying, you know, I don't want to write a diet book, but I am really interested in the biology of fat, which is also known as adipose tissue. Um, are there good things to it? Because when I studied stem cells for regeneration, one of the things that we realized is that our body fat actually contains a lot of stem cells, which is fascinating. And in fact, um, and I read about this in a book, so powerful are these stem cells that can help us regenerate that um, in the clinic, there have been cases published where they've taken people uh, with spinal cord injury where they're paralyzed, uh, can't move their arms and legs, quadriplegia, and, and taken their own body fat, removed the body fat, um, figured out how to get the stem cells out of it. So you put it in a little enzyme, you spin it down, pour off the fat, and you, at the bottom of your test tube, you have some stem cells, and injected it into the severed spinal cord and found that the, that the fat stem cells can actually regenerate spinal cord and, and allow you to move again, like really amazing. And other uh, research I've been involved with has shown that these stem cells can be injected into the heart, um, in the lab, into the brain, and you can actually get recovery uh, from illness. And so on the biotech side, because that's a sort of part of my, my career is thinking about how do we create the next generation of better treatments. I've always thought, body fat is really, really interesting. And yet on a personal level, like I think most of us, you know, I've always considered it something, yeah, you know, like not so pleasant to think about. Well, enter my, uh, the feedback I got from my readers of my first book, Eat to Beat Disease, where I told them about more than 200 foods that it can actually boost your body's health defenses. I got people writing to me saying, I feel stronger. I feel better. I have more energy. Uh, my doctor has told me I can come down or come off my medications. Um, and I thought, okay, that's exactly the output that that's a, that's the feedback I'd hoped to get. But I started getting a few uh, emails saying, you know, actually, uh, in addition to all these good things, I've also started to lose weight in a way that I couldn't lose before. 
first couple of emails, emails I got like that from my book, Eat to Beat Disease, my first book, I thought, okay, well, that's just nice to hear. But I started to get dozens of emails like this as well. And I thought, wait a minute, there's something really bizarre here because here are people that are eating foods that amplify their health defenses, make them make their health stronger. And yet they're eating foods and they're losing weight, right? And, and you know, usually when you think when you're eating foods, you're going to gain weight. How is it that you can eat foods and lose weight? So I started to put together sort of my research with this observation. And it made me wonder, what do we really know about body weight? What do we really know about our metabolism? And what do we really understand about our body fat that is not the obvious? And that's what I wrote my book about is really, what is the new science of the metabolism? And what is the truth behind body fat? Well, what is that truth about body fat? And what, what are we getting so wrong about it? Because it doesn't feel like we're making progress here. Okay, right. Well, what's really interesting, if you want to take, if we step back for a second to look at the global pandemic of obesity and maybe diabetes, if you really think about diabetes and obesity going together, this is a big global problem that is going to and is already crushing our health systems around the world. We just can't be having more and more and younger and younger people um, being overweight and obese and having metabolic disease just impossible. And as they get older, this uh, derailed metabolism and the excess body fat they have are going to be uh, triggering all these chronic diseases like cancer and cardiovascular disease and other metabolic ailments that um, literally are unsustainable, right? So this is why I think the, 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 the health and wellness community at large are springing into action to say, we've got to intercept this somehow. And this is where science actually comes into play. What is the science of body fat? And again, you know, based on everything you know, we were just talking about, this, the global pandemic of, of, of obesity, fat sounds by itself to be something really unpleasant. It turns out that body fat, truthfully, is one of our most critical organs in our body. We think of it, you know, like we think about fat, like when you walk by the butcher section of the grocery store, the rind, you know, on, on the end of a steak, but actually body fat is very much part of who we are as humans and it functions as an organ. And in fact, one of the things that uh, I discovered in writing this book is the origin of body fat. So, uh, which forms in the womb. So when your mom's egg met your dad's sperm and it was a, uh, you became a ball of cells, first tissues that form were your blood vessels, your circulation, because every organ needs um, blood flow in order to survive. The next organ tissue that forms is actually your nerves because all the organs need signals to command them, uh, to instruct them on what to do. That's the wiring. And the third tissue that forms are little globules of fat. And these little globules of fat form around our circulation, around our blood vessels, because these fat globules, little fat cells, are in fact fuel tanks for our body. So when our blood vessels absorb fuel from whatever source, they load the energy, the fuel, into these fat globules as, as storage tanks for our fuel, just like the fuel tank in your car. And so, um, by the way, so that means that we actually had body fat long before we even had a face that we could stuff with food, all right? And so that tells you that fat predates eating fat predates actually, you know, uh, our, our, our arrival on the planet and couch potatoism, as you call it, you know, as we call it. But then the other thing is, if you think about, um, when we see fat, uh, early in life, it's in a baby, right? So every cute, healthy baby is pudgy. Chubby baby is a healthy baby, fat cheeks, chubby tummy, uh, uh, arms and legs like uh, circus balloons. You know, you twist the little poodle uh, in the in the balloon that the clown does. All right, um, and that means that uh, the fat is playing a pretty important role at an early stage of life. In fact, if we saw a baby that had chiseled cheekbones and super thin arms and legs like a runway model, we'd actually say there's something seriously wrong with this baby, right? Yeah, it's true. Lacking enough body fat. So this led me to really dig in to explore what is that incredibly important uh, uh, primal role of body fat. And I think that's really worth talking about. So walk us through, so it, it's clear a baby needs fat. To, to your point, if you see a baby with no fat, you kind of scratch your head and say, is the baby healthy? Is the baby okay? And then obviously 
as we grow older and if we maintain that, that that can become problematic. And so if we think about, you know, the obesity, diabetes, obviously that that's that's not good. Obviously, we've spent well trillions or millions of billions of dollars trying to combat this problem and what we're doing isn't working. And to your point, all fat is not created equal. And so I want to talk about that and talk about your approach because what we're doing isn't working. We, we clearly, on one hand, we need fat to survive. It plays an important role. But the other hand, if you have too much of it, there are severe consequences with regards to our long-term health. And so let's talk about what we're getting wrong and how, how we should think about fat. Yeah, that's that's a you know that's a great lead into reconceptualizing, kind of rebooting how we actually think about body fat. And I want to I want everyone to just sort of consider um, what actually fat does, right? So um, fat serves a couple of different roles, very important roles. One is that uh, fat is a cushion. All right, obviously we have fat. Um, uh, around our, under our skin, it pads us. And we also have fat inside our belly, uh, inside our abdominal cavity. Uh, this is called visceral fat or abdominal fat. And it basically, it's like, pe- it's like uh, the packing peanuts uh, you put in a, a shipping box that kind of protects our organs. In fact, if we didn't have any body fat and we tripped on the rug and fell on the ground, we, our organs would actually rupture. So there's this kind of protective nature of our fat. The other thing that our fat does actually is it um, it's an organ uh, and, it's, and it's an endocrine organ, meaning it actually secretes hormones. There's f- f- uh, more than a dozen different hormones that have been discovered that fat um, actually secretes normally to help us get energy. Remember, I, d- I just mentioned that fat is a fuel tank. So, but, it, but in addition to being a fuel tank, it also is an energy regulator. Fat actually helps to control our metabolism. One of the hormones that it secretes is something that's actually called adiponectin. Adiponectin is the uh, hormone that's at the highest concentration in the body, far higher than any other organ that you can measure, like a thousand times higher. And the reason that that fat hormone adiponectin is so high in our bodies is because it actually controls how much energy we extract from our blood, from our food to just power the engine of our cells. All right. Without fat, your adiponectin levels drop. And by the way, if you have too much fat, excess fat, it screws up the, uh, that hormonal function. So now you don't have a adiponectin. Now you don't use energy well either. So adiponectin is connected to insulin and that actually allows us to actually I'm drawing our energy really, really um, effectively. Now, the other thing, an- another hormone I want to go into is really uh, the opposite of adiponectin, which draws in energy. There's a break to that system called resistin. This is a, a relatively new hormone, and it resists adiponectin. So adiponectin draws in energy, all made by fat. Resistin uh, counters it. It's like the seesaw. So you don't draw in too much energy. So it's like it's kind of like a steering wheel. A little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, like a yoke on an airplane when you're flying. All right, so you're 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 flying on a straight course. You can course correct small course corrections in order to make that whole trip airborne. That's actually part of what our fat's normal function. It is an actual hormone, but like any other hormone, uh, like any other organ, fat is an organ. Um, it has to be in balance, like which is so much about the rest of our body. So that's. Another function of, of fat, and of course, it makes uh, leptin, which actually controls our appetite, which can, infects our brain, and how hungry we feel, and how likely we are to reach for food. Um, but then the other thing that's really amazing about body fat, it, it's actually a space heater. Our body fat can actually generate heat. So it's not just blubber, right? Blubber on a whale actually keeps the whale warm in cold waters, but our fat has this function where it can actually generate heat. And there's a special kind of fat that does it, it's called brown fat. And, and generating heat is a process called thermo, meaning heat, genesis, generating heat. And that's a trigger to increase your metabolism. So the new science of body fat teaches us fat isn't all bad. Fat is actually incredibly important for our survival, but in the right amount. So you don't want to get rid of your fat. You want to respect it and you want to tame it. Well, and I think just demonizing fat 
it's a big catch-all and not all to our point all fat is not created equal i think we've got visceral subcutaneous and brown fat what else am i missing here those are the main ones those are the main ones but like as you mentioned there there are benefits to brown fat and so before we segue to the nutrition piece of this which is is interesting how does one assess how they're doing with regards to their fat is that going straight to a dexa scan but if i'm listening i'm saying okay got it you know everyone has some fat how do i assess how i'm doing if the fat i have is is healthy or or unhealthy how do i get a sense of that well look people who do research and and people who have the technology are able to put the human body into a dexa scan which is kind of a fancy scanner that uh, can match measure uh, uh, uh muscle and fat and where it's located, it can see a lot of different parts and give you a number of what you have. But that's actually not a convenient uh, test to do. Not everyone has it. And it's actually quite difficult to interpret, honestly. And so while it's a useful tool, it's not something you can just kind of go to your local mall uh, or and especially not your doctor's office to get it. And yet it's, it does give us some information. I think one of the real interesting futures of health tech, med tech, is actually to come up with sort of a simpler easier consumer, sharper image version of, of DEXA, if we could actually get to that, that would actually really be something to give us uh, our uh, kind of a home ability to measure the amount of, of fat we have. But I will tell you that for people listening, you know, if you're not a body hacker and you just want to kind of get an idea of your body fat, it's important to look at the, the three different kinds of fat we just talked about. Uh, there's two, two main colors of fat, brown and white. Brown fat is that special fat that can ignite, light up, uh, uh, boost your metabolism by by generating heat thermogenic but the other fat which is called white fat um actually is the jiggly stuff and uh, you know so white fat is subcutaneous or visceral subcutaneous means under the skin so you can see it right subcutaneous fat is what you see under your arm under your chin it's the muffin that people complain about it's around your thighs around your butt um uh, uh and it can be around it can, it can also be around your gut but visceral fat which is the more dangerous kind of fat, is um, actually what is happening in a beer gut, for example. And that's the fat that actually grows and grows and grows inside your body cavity, kind of like, like sausage growing inside the link, get, inside the casing, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that pushes your gut out, right? So that's basically the harmful fat, visceral fat. Of course, people who have large bodies and big bellies probably have a lot of visceral fat, but even skinny people can have visceral fat and we call that skinny fat. And the key thing that people need to understand is visceral fat is like a baseball glove that wraps around your organs. It can choke your organs. And when you have too much of it, of that visceral fat, it completely derails all of these other healthy systems of metabolism in your body. Too much fat derails your metabolism. Not enough fat also derails your metabolism. So it's kind of like Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, not too much, not too little, just the right amount. And I think that's kind of what we're missing. We have been focusing on must kill fat, get rid of fat, must not think about fat until we have to think about fat. And, and then this sort of extreme, now we got to get ultra skinny, uh, which is a problem too. Well, do you, is there a certain, are there labs available? You mentioned that the DEX is not really widely available that one can leverage because it seems like we're kind of flying blind here. Yeah. So look, I come at this as a, as a medical researcher. So, and because my background's in biotech, like I really, really want to have good, accurate, validated tools to be able to measure. So I'm very excited about the future of looking at how to tackle uh, sort of obesity and, and excess body fat. Let's not call it fat. Obe it's, it's excess body fat. Like how do we normalize? How do we, and how do we know what's a biomarker? So I don't think we have one test that you can uh, uh, do that tells you how much visceral, how much brown, how much subcutaneous fat you have. But we have lots of different, what we call surrogate measures that can tell you. You know, your weight on a scale is a little bit, help, is a little bit helpful. DEXA scan is very helpful. Um, again, not re re readily available. But, you know, in your blood, you can actually start to look for other markers as well. Excess fat is very inflammatory. So if you look at an inflammatory marker like CRP, C-reactive protein, all right, which doctors are beginning to use more and more now, um, that lab actually is a pretty in good indicator if you got excess body fat because people with excess fat, their inflammatory marker, CRP, is going to be up for sure. Um, think about what the other hormones I was telling you about, like 
adiponectin and resistin and leptin. These are made by fat. And so we are, you know, what we need to have is kind of like the lipid levels of these fat derived hormones. So we know cholesterol, triglycerides, no HDL and LDL, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. You know, it's well accepted now when you do a blood test. I think what we need is really a panel uh, that tells us about the health of our fat. How much adiponectin, how much resistant, how much leptin are we actually making? And that would probably give us a, a, another handle on our metabolic scale. Now, I've actually been testing something that's really interesting because, uh, and, and we haven't touched on this yet, but what's the connection between body fat and metabolism? And what is metabolism? And, and why do we want to measure it? I think that if there are good measures of metabolism, that could also be a nice surrogate measure of how well you're doing. And let me explain. The right amount of body fat allows our hardwired metabolism to just operate freely, freedom to operate. You're doing what you're designed to do. It's like a new car rolling right off uh, the factory uh, into the showroom, you know, or you're driving it right off the lot, right, right out of the showroom. You know, it, you know that, that new car feel, it's like it, it, it drives beautifully. All right. And you've, and, and that, that probably is going to be the best you've ever, you've ever experienced uh, driving in that car. Um, our body and our metabolism is similarly hardwired. When we are born, all humans have this um, operating system, meta metabolic operating system. We're hardwired to operate our metabolism in the exact same way. In fact, just less than two years ago, there was a massive global research study that completely changed our understanding of human metabolism, right? Look, I'm a doctor. I was educated a couple of decades ago. I was taught all about metabolism um, and I fancy myself as pretty up on the science. When I saw this research publication two years ago, published in the journal Science, which is a highly credible, one of the most credible scientific journals, uh, peer reviewed journals out there, my jaw dropped because I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea this is how human metabolism works. So let me explain the, the research to you now connected to body fat. So this is a, a, a study done by a, led by a, uh, a guy named Herman Ponzer at Duke University, who led um, 90 researchers from 20 countries around the world, and they studied 6,000 people, largest metabolism study ever done in history. And it was remarkable because they studied the metabolism of everyone, all 6,000 people across 20 countries in the exact same way. And not only did they study um, them the same way, it covered the people they studied, their, this experiment, this research study covered the entire human lifespan. They studied humans from two days old to more than 90 years old. That's the entire span of human existence. All right. And they gave everybody a little drink of water, H2O. Uh, and H is hydrogen, O is oxygen, and they were to tweak those atoms a little bit. So you can measure when, when after you drink a, 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 some of this water, you can measure in the breath, you can measure in the blood, you can measure in the urine, how your metabolism is actually uh, interacting and generating and working with these molecules. And basically that's how you measure metabolism. It's kind of like a metabolic cart, but they did it the same way using a little bit of, of water, of, of, uh, of uh, they call it deuterated water. Okay. Um, now, when they measured metabolism in all these people, 6,000 people over 20 countries across two days to 90, 90 years old, what do you think they found? The results, metabolism is all over the map, all right? Just like you'd expect. It was, a, it was a, a, a sea of chaos, uninterpretable data, except now what they, what, no, we, we live in this sort of age of computational power um, and algorithms and being able to really go in and and really mine that data. So an algorithm was developed in which for every individual who took part in this metabolism study, they were able to look at their body size and they were able to actually subtract the influence of excess body fat. We just talked about earlier about how excess body fat derails you. So they were able to, for every patient, correct for that, every individual correct for that and remove the effect of excess body fat from the results. And all of a sudden, from the sea of confusion, what they found was amazing. It was sort of like this brand new view of humanity, where it, it turns out that all humans over the course of our life go through only four phases of metabolism, four stages of metabolism. And these four stages tell us how we're hardwired. It's like looking at the operating system and understanding the code. All right. Because, and this is why this is important is because how many of us have heard this idea that 
well, you're either born with a slow metabolism or a fast metabolism. My sister was lucky. She was born with a fast metabolism. That's why she's skinny as a stick and she could eat anything. I wasn't. And I've had to struggle with my weight. And that's why I got to watch what I eat. Like we, we, op, we, we have all these assumptions that that's how it actually works. Even me, I, I, I was educated that way. Turns out that's not true. You're not born with a slow metabolism. We're all born with the same metabolism. And what happens is as we go through our journey of life, um, uh, we gain, we, we have different behaviors. We make different choices and we can grow extra body fat. And in this study, what they did is they found that when you actually add the effect, so there's four phases, once you actually remove the effect of body fat, when you start adding body fat back into the equation, you crush those four phases, you really degrade your metabolism. So it's not that a slow metabolism causes you to gain body fat and gain weight. It's the other way around. When you gain excess body fat, it crushes your metabolism. It prevents your hardwired uh, operating system from working the way it's supposed to be. What that means, by the way, and I want to I'll explain what those four stages are. What that means is actually good news when it comes to controlling this obesity pandemic, epidemic, is that it means that that it like our metabolism and our and our body fat and obesity isn't simply our fate that we actually can try to fight this excess body fat, find a way to right size it, tame it, in order to be able to unleash our inner metabolism. That I think is really how we're gonna solve this problem, is how do we allow humans to actually do what they wanna do? And I think that's why it's important to understand, you know, for everyone to understand what we've just discovered in the last two years. Yeah, so walk us through those four stages and then, Tell us, you know, what does this mean for, for, for our listeners? What, what can we do? Yeah, it, it, it's so fascinating, uh, Jason. So I'm going to walk you through the, st the stages of, of human metabolism. This is, by the way, this is so new that it's not in the medical textbooks yet. But what's happening is that the metabolism textbooks are being ripped up and thrown out and new ones are being written in real time. So we're really talking about some pretty uh, game-changing research discoveries about our bodies. The workings of our body. So, stage one. Thank God, because what we're doing is not working. I, well, listen, I, I'm, I'm always an optimist that research and science is really kind of uncovering, uh, uncloaking new ways to do better and be better. And I think this is an example of it. So, stage the first stage of our human metabolism starts from the day we're born. Most of us are pretty synced up with our mom's um, metabolism when we're born. Makes sense. We are actually living inside the womb. Um, but from day zero to what the first to, the, uh, to your first birthday, age one, your metabolism skyrockets, goes up, 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 about 50% higher than what your metabolism will be as an adult. All right. And that's why how we actually feed and the environments we expose babies to actually matters so much because the metabolism is absorbing all these influence and being influenced. So, you know, this uh, postnatal period, early life uh, conditioning, really important for taking care of babies when it comes to metabolism. That's stage one, zero to one years old. The second stage is from one year old to 20 years old, and the metabolism goes down, 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 down. Now think about what I just said. One to 20 means going right through adolescence, teenage years, that's when the kids skyrocket in height. They're eating two dinners. They're bouncing off the walls full of energy. And parents have always thought, you know, my kid's metabolism must be going, going up because they're growing up and they're, that's why they're eating so much. And yet that's not what's happening. Our heart, our operating system, our hardwired metabolisms actually making it slow down, 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 down to adult levels. So that's phase stage two. Stage three is from age 20. So you're just great. You're finishing college. All right. Um, all the way to age 60. And guess what? In this third stage, metab human metabolism, the program, the operating system is rock steady, rock stable. It does not go down, does not go down to, from pregnancy, does not go down through menopause, does not go down when you're in your 40s or 50s, all the way into your 60s. It's rock stable. All right. And that's a big surprise because we always assumed that is a big surprise. I think you made a lot of people happy, including myself at age 48. Well, let me tell you, what this is how we're hardwired. What that, what that means is that 60 can be the new 20 if you allow your metabolism to do its job for you. Okay. And so what's really startling is, so how do you explain 
weight gain after menopause? How do you explain, you know, um, uh, the, the weight gain after pregnancy? How do you explain all these things? It's really that um, our, our metabolism is working against, our natural metabolism working against, swimming uphill against all these forces, life stresses, depression, hormonal changes can also change, you know, um, your behavior. And of course, think about the, the how our behavior is influenced by marketing and so sociology. I'm just going to, I just want to repeat that because I think it's so important. 60 can be the new 20 because that's where actually the science is on metabolism. So it's not an excuse for anyone listening up until age 60. 60 can be the new 20. I think, I think that's a message of empowerment. Uh, completely. And, and because it means that we are in, you know, our bodies want to do something, right? It's like you're a laptop, right? They, yeah, and and, and it, it, it's operating systems running. And then after a while, it might kind of start have gl be a little glitchy. You know what? Just remember your operating systems hardwired. If you actually kind of get rid of the viruses, vi an antiviral program, you actually reboot, close down some of the windows. Look, your operating system wants to do what it wants to do. That's why 60 is the new 20. Now, this, that's the third stage. The fourth stage of metabolism, human metabolism, is from age 60 to 90. So we're really taking us to the tail end of where most of us uh, will live. That's stage four. Your metabolism does go down a little bit, only 17%. So that by the time you're 90, your metabolism is only 17% lower than when it was at 60, which is only 17% lower than it was when you were at 20. And that's the key thing. Even when we are elderly, it doesn't mean that we necessarily have to become frail. I love it. And so th this is just so powerful because I think so many people out there think, you know, I'm too old, my metabolism's changed, or I was born with a slow metabolism or fast metabolism. And I think you just debunked all that. I think that's a message that's important. With all that said, how do we get it right? How do we get our metabolism back on track? Because clearly we're doing a lot of things that are derailing our metabolism. Well, it, 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 that's really true. So remember what I told you in this research study, the, the, in this discovery, the, in order to find that, that inner metabolism, our inner heart operating system, basically had to peel away the effects of excess body fat, not all body fat, but the, too much of it. So, and when you add, ex, when you add the body fat back, more body fat, excess body fat, you start to uh, uh, suppress um, your, your metabolism and that's not good. Okay, so how do you get rid of excess body fat? Well, this now comes down to some of the ways that we treat our body. And, uh, and it actually comes, it actually intersects a bit with what has become popularly known as intermittent fasting and, you know, um, and, and a lot of, uh, you know, sort of modern practices and thinking about metabolic health. I wanna to try to explain things to people watching and listening very, very simply. The fuel that we actually uh, consume as food influences our uh, fat, which then influences our metabolism. Too much food, too, mu too much food, too much fuel, too much fat, and it, it sits on your metabolism, all right? So let me give you this analogy. Uh, our body is like a car, it runs, its engine has to run, and like your car, um, you're, when you're driving your car, you have a fuel gauge, uh, for those of us who are still driving a gas car. Um, uh, and when the fuel gauge runs low, what do you do? You pull over to the filling station, gas station, and then you get out and you put the nozzle into the gas tank and you fill up the tank, right? Okay. Got to turn off the engine. And, uh, and then when the tank is full, the, the, it, the, the, the nozzle clicks, no more gas is pumped. You put it back and you drive off. All right. And, and then rinse and repeat. Our body is uh, operates like a car. Our engine has to run, and the way that our engine runs is with our, our fuel. The fuel in our body actually comes from food. All right, and our metabolism is actually what's responsible for actually providing our body and running that engine smoothly, just like the car. And by the way, uh, when our bodies uh, so body runs on fuel, fuel comes from food. By the way, we call our fuel not gasoline; we call it calories. All right. And I, I don't want people to start thinking like that. Oh, so that means I got to count calories. Look, actually, it's just like, you know, you're not you're not counting every gallon that's actually in your gas tank. You know, when it's full, when, you know, when you when you filled it up, the problem when you're with food as our fuel is that unlike a gas pump, 
we don't have an automatic clicker when our tank is full. Well, we've got enough to run the energy when the tank fuel tank is full. And so what happens is that uh, uh, we can kind of keep on putting more fuel into our body far beyond the capacity of our tank. If you were at a gas station and the, that clicker on the nozzle didn't, didn't go on, once your tank is full and the fuel keeps on coming out, what's going to happen? The fuel will come out of the gas tank. It's overflowing. It's going to run down the side of the car, run down the side of the tires, pull around your feet. And now you're going to be standing in this flammable, dangerous mess, right? And it's got to evaporate uh, in order for it to clear. In our bodies, when we put more fuel, because we don't have that clicker, we just kept, keep on eating. What the body does with the fuel is it uses some of it in the blood to just power your regular cells. Anything extra gets stuffed into our fuel tanks. Remember I told you fuel tanks are little fat cells. Little fat cells are our fuel tanks. They're supposed to be. They're really important for us. And so extra fuel gets put into our fuel tank. But if we don't have the clicker and we keep on overeating, we put too much fuel in our bodies, what happens is that that fuel tank, the fuel keeps on getting stuffed into the little fat cells. The little fat cells gets bigger, bigger. It's like just a balloon that gets get filled up with more and more and more fuel. It's going to expand. Oops, now it's, it's stretched to its limit. Now the body has to make more fuel tanks. Now you have more fat cells that are being produced. And now you've actually went from one fat cell to two fat cells. And that thing has to be filled up with fuel as well. So if, when we overeat, it, we actually can really, really blow up our fuel tanks. Uh, and so the key really for our body to burn down the, that few extra fuel, if we don't over, even if we don't overflow it, is we want to allow our body to burn and tap into the energy. So we're actually, just like in a car, consuming the fuel. Uh, that's really how our metabolism works. It's not any more complicated than that to the average person. So don't overeat, okay? And then the other key thing to realize is that when we're filling our tanks by eating, the way that our body re receives that fuel, I remember I told you the hormone adiponectin that collaborates with insulin. So when you eat, your insulin goes up, your adiponectin is there saying, okay, guys, let's go absorb that fuel, get that energy, get that motor, you know, get that engine fueled up. All right. When we're fueling up, we can't burn that energy. All right. Uh, our body's not hardwired that way. So it shuts off the ability to burn uh, for the most part. And you're, you're able to fill up. Now, when you're not eating, when you stop eating, like when you're sleeping, okay, you're not eating when you're sleeping, um, then actually your insulin levels go down. And when your insulin levels go down, uh, basically your body, your metabolism switches gears and says, all right, now we can burn fuel. So in when we're sleeping, we're actually able to tap into that, the fuel that's stored in our fat tanks and burn that fuel down. All right. And, and that's basically how our body works. And so when people talk about um, uh, intermittent fasting, look, I, our bodies actually, we normally intermittently fast most when we're sleeping. And when we're sleeping, our body switches into fat burning mode. And so intermittent fasting is really what we're doing when we're sleeping. And then when we wake up and we break our fast by eating breakfast, that's breakfast, okay, then we're starting to raise our insulin levels again, and we're starting to load up on fuel, all right? And so the longer we give our metabolism a chance to burn down that extra fuel, the more fuel we're able to actually dispose of. And that actually burns down harmful body fat, extra energy. And that's really kind of the underlying basis of intermittent fasting. Like it's not really a trend, it's how we do it. And if we can, if we can tweak it, fine tune it, harness how our body, our metabolism naturally works, then we can actually use this uh, fuel loading, fuel burning system. And that's why if you get eight hours of sleep, um, 11, to, uh, 11 to 7, for example, uh, for the typical sleep, let's say, um, use that time to burn fuel. But remember, if your insulin is up, you can't be burning it. So basically, if you eat dinner at 7 o'clock the night before and you put your dishes away, you're done at 8, all right, and you don't eat after that and you go to bed at 11, then you've got three extra hours of, quote, fasting your insulin levels will start to decline. You've got more chance to burn down extra energy, extra fat. And if you get up in the morning and you don't roll out of bed like your mommy told you to when you were a kid to hurry up and eat and get on the school bus to get to school, but you get up in the morning, let's say you get up at seven and you wind up getting dressed, uh, you, you know, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, getting dressed, checking your emails, whatever it is you're doing, wait an hour before you eat anything. All right, now you've gained an extra hour of burning fuel. So think about it, eight hours of sleep, 
three hours before uh, between dinner and sleep. All right, that's 11 hours. Add tack on an extra hour. Now you got 12 hours, pretty easily accomplished of fasting or fuel burning. And you know, and then and then if you really want to extend it to 16 hours, like people that do the 16-8 uh, intermittent fasting, a little bit more extreme. You got to really tweak your schedule uh, and and kind of get your head space into being able to do that. But that's really one way that we can actually just use what happens in our body. And of course, I said food, food is fuel. The quality of your fuel matters a heck of a lot. Just like a car. If you put crappy fuel into your car, you're going to run down your engine. It's not going to perform really well. And that's where the quality of the fuel matters a lot. So let's go there. You know, make sense on duration, practice some sort of circadian fasting or in, intermittent fasting or time restricted eating however you want to think about it uh don't overeat quantity plays a role but let, let's let's go to quality what what are those best fat fighting foods if you will and then of, of course we got to talk about the bad ones but let's start with the good ones first of all um what we do know is that the that uh, foods that are nutrient dense have lots of bioactives. These are phytochemicals, polyphenols, dietary fiber, soluble fiber. These are all the things that we're hearing about, um, mostly in plant-based foods, but you don't have to be a vegan or a vegetarian. You just need to really uh, embrace the fact that a lot of the plant-based foods give us densely high quality fuel for our body. So not only does it have carbs and sugars, okay, uh, to help you know, get that short-term um, kind of uh, uh, energy f kick. It also loads our body with lots of other substances that can help protect our metabolism. One of the things is um, uh, foods that actually uh, can prompt our circulation, our body's health defense of angiogenesis, our, our blood cir circulation to be really, really good. Better blood flow, better transmission of energy, uh, better delivery of polyphenols to your cells. Your your whole metabolism is going to operate better. So, uh, what are some foods that can actually be very helpful for your circulation? Well, um, uh, we do know that uh, whole grains uh, uh, like barley uh, actually can be good. Um, uh, buckwheat actually can be really great uh, for your circulation. It turns out that dark chocolate, cacao minus the cadmium and the lead that we apparently have discovered is in there, um, uh, can be, uh, can be uh, really, really beneficial. Uh, fruit peel, again, an argument for having organic, so you don't eat the pesticides that are in the fruit peel, and also more polyphenols, but fruit peel contains something called ursolic acid that powers up your circulation. Better circulation, everything runs better. Your hormones are actually running better, including that fat hormone, adiponectin, and the resistant. The actually, so that's our circulation as an example. Uh, another uh, another thing that's really important for good quality um, uh, uh, foods, and I'm going to I'm going to come to sort of like the punchline here because there's like a really big category of foods um, are foods that can actually control our stem cells earlier. We talked about how our fat has stem cells. Remember, I told you you can take there, some researchers have taken them out, injected into the spinal cord, and grown spinal cord, which is amazing. Well, it turns out that fat actually contains some stem cells by itself, right? Because if we overeat, our body needs to make more fat quickly, right? More fuel cells, quick, more fuel tanks quickly, and so our our st fat stem cells can actually grow. Well, it turns out that some foods can actually tame our fat stem cells, so they are less likely to make more fat. All right, carrots can do that. They can just like, it's like whip, tame, back boy. You know, like you're, you're no, don't make more fat cells. And that can be helpful. Tomatoes, lycopene, um, uh, carrots, beta cryptoxanthin, they all are fat taming. They actually calm down the stem cells that are in our fat that might try to actually grow up. And by the way, some of these polyphenols in our plant-based foods also lower inflammation because when you have too much body fat, it's a highly inflammatory environment. Remember the gasoline pooling on your feet when your tank is over full? So basically these, these nutrient dense plant-based foods can also lower the inflammation and protect you overall, your health overall, um, if there's inflammatory fat that's around, that's extra fat. Um, uh, 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 fiber rich foods, okay, especially soluble fiber, like mushrooms, like kiwi, like avocado, actually uh, uh, when we eat them, they're also filled with polyphenols and all kinds of great stuff, but that fiber, dietary fiber feeds our gut microbiome, the 39 trillion bacteria that live 
towards the end of our gut, that ecosystem that helps us be healthy. It streamlines our metabolism. It helps us absorb lipids and cholesterols in the right levels. It actually makes our body more sensitive to insulin so we can be efficient with our energy use from the food that we actually eat. And so we want to be able to feed our gut microbiome and protect our DNA because again, uh, you know, when you've got a lot of body fat, you're creating a lot of uh, free radicals and reactive oxygen species. Uh, I, th I think you've talked about this before on your show. Basically, these are the things that antioxidants actually neutralize. You're knocking the missiles out of the air. Um, uh, and, and so that actually helps to quell the damage caused by fat. And, and then your immune system, foods that actually boost your immune system, like uh, sulforaphane containing foods, brassica, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, broccoli rob, uh, bok choy. Uh, the, the sulforaphanes actually calm inflammation. They boost protective immunity. And by the way, healthy fat, healthy amounts of fat, good fat actually contains about 20% of your immune system. Our immune system lives inside our fat. So we don't want it to be inflamed. We also don't, but we wanted to basically have a nice hive of immune cells in there so they can actually fight on our behalf. And so, so basically there are foods like that that actually just help us stay overall healthy and help tame our metabolism. But then that's just kind of keeping us at baseline. But then the real punchline that I deliver in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is what I was so surprised by, which helps me explain why my readers for my first book were actually losing weight, Okay is that some of the polyphenols in about 150 foods that I've discovered and write about in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, actually trigger your body while you're eating to burn more fat. So even though your body's hardwired when you're eating not, not to burn fuel, there are certain foods that have are nutrient dense that have substances that will trigger your body to actually fire up your metabolism. So there are foods that light up your metabolism. So on that list, I know it's an extensive list in the book. I have it right here. You know, people should pick up the book. It's a great read. What was the most unexpected? In my book, I um, take people, my, my readers, onto a tour of the grocery store. Uh, in a kind of like, I, 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 as I wrote it, this is what I, I'm sort of giving you a little bit of an author's inside, inside look of how I wrote this book. I was imagining, like, Jason, if you were to, sit inside my grocery cart uh, as we entered the store and I was pushing you through the sections, through the produce sections, um, et, et cetera, and pointing out what are the foods you should be looking for. So of course, a lot of the, in the produce section, there's really great stuff, right? Apples and pears and, you know, uh, uh, and, and uh, broccoli and mushrooms and uh, 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 the onions and garlic, all the stuff that you, we already know is good for our health overall. They're also good for our metabolism. The things that I thought were most surprising, and I, and I was a whole chapter on this, I take you sitting in my grocery cart into those forbidden middle aisles of the grocery store, right? Like how many, how many times we've we been hit over the head, shop only the perimeter, stay out of the middle aisles. Well, in this book, I take you right into the jungle. And in fact, the whole chapter is called treasure hunt because I think it's really important for people to know there's metabolic treasures in the middle aisles and it's real gold that's hidden in a sea of fool's gold. So to get to avoid the crap that's out there in the middle aisles, but I, I take you through and that's where the surprises are. Surprises are like uh, prunes actually can help you lose weight, shrinks your waist for comfort, canned beans, navy beans, which you'd make baked beans or you, you know, make bean soup. That can also decrease visceral fat, that harmful baseball glove fat that can develop even in skinny people inside your body can shrink your waist circumference, your waistline. This can be documented by DEXA scanning. Um, five cans or five cups of, of, of beans that you can buy in a can, ready to eat beans that you'd get in the middle section, uh, five days a week, one cup five days a week, actually can shrink your waistline by about an inch over the course of a month. And what it does is that beans have dietary fiber and some other polyphenols that activate our metabolism and unleash our inner metabolism. So your metabolism increases while your harmful body fat, excess body fat shrinks. That was a big surprise to me. I, I can go on and on. Uh, capers, also really great. I love capers. Uh, so delicious. The thing in uh, uh, tinned uh, fish, you know, there's, there's a seafood section. I used to think when I was a kid, 
Well, I used to think when I was a kid that canned tuna fish was like cat food. Smelled like it, looked like, like it, um, but cat food. But it turns out that if you go to Spain, if you go to Asia, like tinned um, uh, seafood, uh, sardines, mackerel, but also a whole host of shellfish. Um, it, it's called conservas in Spain and Portugal. It's actually a specialty. It's actually some of the tastiest, most delicious fish. They they poach them, they season them, they pack them in extra virgin olive oil. You can rip open one of these cans and, and just with a fork, take a bite um, uh, of metabolically activating delicious food. So I thought that that was really, really a surprising lot. But I'll tell you two things that really kind of did surprise me. Um, one thing was apple cider vinegar or vinegar, I, I should say. I, I have it every day. So listen, you probably beat me to this, uh, Jason, but you know, about 10 years ago uh, around, I remember I had friends who were telling me, oh, I'm actually taking apple cider vinegar every day uh, to, for weight loss. And I would go like, huh? Are you kidding me? Like, that's all bunk. It doesn't work. It can't work, right? I eat my words now, or maybe drink my words. Um, turns out that the data actually shows that apple cider vinegar does weight work to lose weight, and it, but does it by trimming your body fat because the acetic acid, which is what vinegar actually is, acetic acid, um, uh, which is an apple cider vinegar, red wine vinegar, black vinegar, uh, any kind of balsamic vinegar, it's all in there. The tang actually stimulates your fat cells, prevents them from getting bigger, turns on fat burning processes. And actually researchers have been, research has done this to show that t looking low dose apple cider vinegar, one tablespoon a day or high dose, two tablespoons a day of apple cider vinegar, mixed into a beverage so you don't dissolve your teeth, um, taken, just drank twice, split into two doses, actually can shrink your waist circumference and objectively by DEXA scan, decrease your visceral body fat. It's quite amazing. So this is where the science is actually going. So I was very, very surprised um, when I saw that because I, I thought for sure it wasn't going to work, but my gosh, it actually does work. And vinegar is quite amazing to actually uh, eat as well. And of course, chili peppers is also another thing that I found really cool uh, uh, that, you know, dried or fresh chili peppers actually like actually fire up your metabolism, increases your metabolism shortly after you eat it and you can feel it. Fascinating. You know, just to come back to ACV, it's been shown to minimize glucose response before a meal. I think there are just general health and longevity benefits, but I had no idea about the weight loss. Fascinating. Yeah, and it actually shrinks waist circumference. So that means that it gets rid of it shrinks your visceral fat. So think about waist circumference as you know, as if you were to measure the 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 diameter of the sausage casing with meat in it. But when you add more fat, the sausage casing is going to stretch. That's when you need to actually unloosen a belt hole, right? So when you shrink your waist circumference, which ACV will do, you're actually able to tighten up your belt circumference because you're pulling fat out of the casing. That to me is so fascinating that our body, that there are foods that our body, our fat cells respond to. So when we started out, you were saying like, what's the new science of fat? This is a new science of fat. So before we head over to the, the foods, which we should avoid, which I'm going to venture a guess to what they are. And I think our audience will too. You know, one of the things I like about the book is you kind of preach diversity of foods. And I think we have a tendency in our space to, 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 you know, demonize a certain food or find one superfood that becomes the hero food and we can't get enough of it. And you mentioned mushrooms a couple of times and, and you've, and then specifically about, is it reishi or reishi? I can never get it. Reishi. Because you say there are tremendous health benefits there, but maybe we should be careful about how much we're consuming. Same degree. Yeah, well, let's talk about mushrooms. Because I, first of all, I love, I, I like to cook, and I love to cook mushrooms. I love the taste of mushrooms. Uh, the thing is that mushrooms have the soluble fiber, beta D glucan, activate your health defenses, better circulation, lower inflammation, good for your gut, uh, good for your immunity. Um, but beta glucan also uh, lights up your metabolism and helps you shrink body fat. That's been studied as well. Can um, help you lose, uh, uh, tighten up your belt loop. Uh, by shrinking the visceral fat in your belly. 
Okay, now beta, now, now beta glucan, uh, beta D glucan, this is a bioactive. It's naturally present in all kinds of species of mushrooms. So whether you're talking about white button, shiitake, portobello, baby bella, uh, uh, you know, it's all there. Okay, chanterelle. It's also present in reishi and lion's mane and, you know, all the more exotic mushrooms that have become more popular in a health and wellness space. Now, I know that I first started to look at reishi uh, and lion's mane mushroom as a researcher because we were at one point doing drug discovery and trying to see are there molecules, substances in reishi uh, mushrooms that could actually be useful for fighting cancer. The short answer is yes, they are there, um, but there it's not just a single molecule. There's a lot of different things that are uh, in, in reishi. But if you look at where reishi and lion's mane and some of turkey tail, you know, some of those mushrooms come from, they are in Asia used judiciously as medicinal mushrooms, which are different than culinary mushrooms. And so I think that this idea that we tend to just say, we, you know, like I think in our in our community, in our, in our country, we tend to oversimplify. A mushroom is a mushroom. If a white butt mushroom is good, I'm going to go for the reishi because it must be, it's more expensive. It must be better. It's more, must be more potent. I would say, you know what? There's culinary mushrooms that are great for the metabolism. And these medicinal mushrooms that have been used for thousands of years also have their benefit. They will have the same stuff that the culinary mushrooms have, but they'll have also more. And what we need to be a little bit cautious about is we're still trying to figure out what some of those good things are. And because they're so potent, more of a reishi or a lion's mane, turkey tail, is not necessarily better. And because we don't know what the toxicities might be and what the interactions with other medications might be and how individuals might react differently, I always try to urge people when it comes to medicinal foods, try to be a little bit cautious about that. More isn't always more. I think that's such an important message because there are often unintended consequences. And we're doing our own end of one experiments uh, and anything with great benefits also has great side effects. So always something to keep in mind. It's that old, it's that old Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. So when you're using those medicinal mushrooms, careful. And so I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this because I think a lot of it's straightforward, but we have to cover the, the bad foods. I know ultra processed foods is, is a big one. What, what are some of the other foods just to, in summary that we should we should avoid for the sake of our metabolism. I'm going to go right there, but first let me just sort of tie into a bow a lot of the healthy foods that are in my book that we've mentioned some of them and 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 what they mean because the because everything that's not there actually are the things we should probably avoid. All right. So I've described in my book foods that actually cover both uh, that are popular in both Asian cuisine, which is 70 different countries worth of cuisine and Mediterranean cuisine. And there's like 20 some countries surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. And all of these regions, are, which are um, have some of the healthiest traditional food patterns in the world, we know that from the blue zones, we know that from large epidemiological studies, um, tend to gravitate towards the things that we already know are healthy. Fresh, seasonal, um, uh, you know, combined with healthy fats, um, nuts and legumes, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, some seafood. So, you know, like it, it's so actually a lot of the things that we've been hearing about make total sense, make even more sense when it comes to the science, you know, um, but the foods that are harmful are the ones that tend to actually be more modern. So you talk about obesity being, we're seeing like this crazy escalation, skyrocketing of rates of obesity. You know, this actually didn't start in the 1800s. It started in the mid 1900s, um, really with the industrialization of food. And when food started to, when we started to realize, look, we can make a lot of food, a lot of tasty food, really cheaply, really fast, and and stick around for a long time. That was where ultra processed foods actually start started to be created. And the idea of ultra processed versus processed is important. Ultra processed is taking whole foods breaking them down into components and then mixing with other things that don't naturally belong together and shaping them into a form that, you know, your grandmother, as they say, don't wouldn't recognize as a food, like in a box of cereal or something you put in a toaster oven or, you know, you air fry, like those kinds of things that are really tasty that were flooded with marketing about. Those are ultra processed foods. Now, why are ultra processed foods not good for our metabolism is because they often contain artificial preservatives artificial flavorings, artificial sweeteners, and artificial coloring. 
They also create a, contain a lot of salt, and they, and they also contain a lot of added sugar, including fructose. And fructose actually specifically pisses off your fat cells to actually become more inflammatory. All right, so high fructose corn syrup, which you find in uh, beverages, you know, sodas and drinks, man, that is a, a real kind of like um, wickedly bad thing if you're trying to tame your body fat. Eat a little bit, it's no problem. Like I'm a, I'm a realist and, and I enjoy food. I believe you should live your life, enjoy your life. So every now and then you want to do something you really just enjoy, but if you eat it regularly, I think this is where this, this epidemic is coming from. Regularly eating ultra processed foods in boxes, cans, bags, okay, making that your mainstay at the expense of plant-based foods, fresh uh, with healthy fats. Uh, saturated fats, also um, not good for your metabolism. Extra salt, not good for your metabolism. Extra sugar, by the way, extra sugar, right? Well, um, I'm not talking about fruits, like a mango. It's one of the sweetest fruits that I know of. I love mangoes or a sweet summer peach. Uh, there's a lot of sugar in there. Yeah, should you stay away from them because they're dangerous? Not for most people because although they're sweet, they are so nutrient dense. They have so many other good things that if you have a generally healthy metabolism that you've taken care of, you can tackle that um, uh, the natural sugars from a pear or a mango pretty quickly. Look at split actually. But when you actually have a can of soda that has nine tablespoons of sugar in it, refined sugar, that is like instantly overloading your metabolism with sugar. It's so much. Your body can't really handle that um, very well. And so that sugar winds up being really poisoning your metabolism. Um, uh, so remember that old, uh, thing that kids used to talk about, like if you're playing pranks at a teenager, putting sugar in the gas tank, like that would kill the engine. That's kind of what happens to our body's engine when we actually have too much excess sugar. So that's also really bad as well. So those are some of the broad categories, um, fried foods, you know, I would say, cut them down or cut them out because, you know, the frying process actually changes the chemical nature of food. And so you can take, by the way, healthy foods. And if you cook them, prepare them in unhealthy ways, um, th that's not necessarily good. And a great example of that is, you know, you can take a piece of seafood, a salmon or a cod, you can batter coat it and fry it. Now you've taken a, a food that's actually pretty good for you and you made it not so good for you, right? Um, or a potato, take a purple potato, fry it as a chip and eat it. And now you've taken a good food and make it not so good for you. So again, I think we should try to avoid um, uh, crude categorizations uh, and oversimplification. And, and, and that, and that but, but you know, broadly speaking, those are the foods that are not so good for our metabolism and that can actually help us, that actually foster the growth of harmful excess body fat. In, in terms of fostering growth, you know, let, let's segue to the microbiome and more specifically a healthy microbiome and the role it plays. And in the book, you talk about acromancia, which is, I think, a hot topic these days. Can you talk a little bit about acromancia and the role it plays here and, and, and maybe give us some, some great sources naturally as well? Almost everyone who's interested in health and wellness has heard of the gut microbiome, and there. Are, when, and when you listen to p experts talking about gut microbiome, it, it, you kind of feel like, wow, we kind of have it down. We kind of know all about it. I'm a researcher. I'm a scientist. I actually study the microbiome as well. And so, uh, what a scientist will tell you, honestly, is that we know how important it is. It's really remarkable. It's an amazing uh, area to study, but we hardly know anything about it. We're just beginning to discover the first important little bits of it. And so we, so we've got our, our microbiome in our gut is this ecosystem of about 39 trillion bacteria. That's more bacteria in your gut than stars are in the night sky when you can actually see them clearly. All right. And these bacteria are doing all kinds of things for us. And they're in different species and different um, communities. And they, and they communicate with one another. And by the way, it's not just bacteria. We call it healthy gut bacteria. You've got the micro, the true microbiome is not just bacteria. It's, it's viruses. It's fungus. It's archaea, which is a whole other species of animals that lives uh, in the world, including in our gut. So again, you know, like if you're talking to a scientist, I can kind of take you on a deep dive if you want to go there. Um, but mostly how much we don't know. So what do we know? We do know that if you have an upset ecosystem of your microbiome, 
your tummy is not going to feel good. You're going to feel gassy, crampy, constipated. You're going to have loose stools or diarrhea. Um, your, your appetite's going to be funny. Like that's how we know when our gut microbiome is not happy. So we want to be able to fix that. And, and what research has done is try to associate specific bacteria with the healthy feeling of the gut and the healthy function of your metabolism uh, and your immune system versus the unhealthy part of it. And so we're just beginning this expedition into the great unknown to discover what are the important bacteria. One of the bacteria we've discovered is called Ackermansia. It's A-K-K-E-R-M-A-N-S-I-A. -A -A. That's its first name or the genus and its last name were the species. So for genus and species is how scientists call bacteria. The first name is Ackermansia. The last name is Mucinophila, okay? And the reason I'm pointing this out uh, is because there, there's different kinds of Ackermansia. Mucinophila is named, got this last name because it loves to grow in mucus. Mucino, mucus. Philia means it loves to grow in mucus. And so where do you find Ackermansia mucinophila and why is it important? Well, it grows in a mucus that's normally in our gut. Ooh, it sounds gross, right? I got mucus in my gut. Yeah, if you didn't have mucus in your gut, you'd be constipated. Your poop wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to squeeze out of there. Mucus helps move things along. Okay, carry on, move along the line. All right, um, and that's what mucus actually does. And Ackermansia loves to live in there. This one bacteria has been discovered to be a guardian of our health. I'm sure there are thousands and probably other millions of other bacteria that are as yet undiscovered that have also very powerful roles. But Ackermansia is a guardian. People, it helps our um, uh, insulin, our bodies become sensitive to insulin, helps insulin control. It actually um, seems to be uh, preventative towards diabetes, both uh, mostly type two, okay? Because uh, type one is autoimmune, but type two, it actually seems to really be a governor. And if you've got good acromancy working on your behalf, it actually lowers the risk of, of, of um, type two diabetes. It also, funnily enough, seems to influence body fitness. So, if uh, a study that I write about in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is that uh, a study out of Beijing showed that in people who were overweight and obese compared to people who were lean and fit, in body shape. If you looked in their poop, you look at their fecal tests and look at their microbiome sampling. Um, Ackermansia is present in the lean fit body types, but com almost completely absent in the overweight and obese people. Now that's not, th that association is not causality, but that association is really important because of the role of Ackermans in controlling your insulin, controlling your metabolism. So it does make a lot of sense. Now, how did I learn, first learn about Ackermansia? I have to say, I'm one of the people that, um, uh, triggered the, the, the beginning of the conversation in the health and wellness community about Ackermansia because I found out about it in 2017 at a cancer research conference that I convened in Paris. Uh, the, the conference was called um, Rethinking Cancer, and we brought some of the world's experts on cancer research together to talk about the latest research on how to fight cancer with one ground rule. You can't talk about chemotherapy, you can't talk about surgery, you can't talk about radiation. And so when you remove that as a ground rule, put that filter in, what are you left with at a, a cutting edge con cancer conference? nutrition, diet, microbiome, sleep, exercise, activity, all the things that matter that doctors and oncologists don't talk about. All right, so one of the most amazing presentations that I heard that sh in which um, this researcher named Laurence Zitvogel, who is at the Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris, it's with the largest cancer research center in Europe, okay, is an immuno-oncologist and, um, and Laurence, uh, who was a colleague of mine at that point, basically presented data that would, had been embargoed and it was about to be published the next week. And it was a study of 200 people with different cancers, all receiving immunotherapy, which is the state-of-the-art cancer therapy. It's not chemo. You get an infusion that actually helps your, uh, it ramps up your body's immune system to search out and destroy cancer cells. Okay. My own mother was treated with it, by the way. And, and, and it completely dry erased away all of our cancer from stage four to stage zero with three infusions. All right. So game changing. Uh, President Jimmy Carter, uh, who was in his 90s, was diagnosed with melanoma that spread to his brain. Game over, right? 
wrong. He received immunotherapy and using his own 90 year old immune system, um, this, this prompted his health defense immune system to scrub out and race all the cancer in his body. Now he's the oldest president alive. I think he turns a hundred this year. All right. So this is game changing. However, only about 20% of people respond the way we want to respond. Only 20%. That means that 80% of people, cancer patients getting the state of their treatment don't respond. Now, if you were only a drug development person or a pharmacologist or oncologist, you would say, you know, I don't understand that. Or man, that treatment doesn't work really well. I don't know how to. So this is what we descended upon in this conference. What makes a responder and not a non-responder? Turns out that the people, the 20% of people in Dr. Zitvogel's research study that had been embargoed at the time she presented it, the 20% of responders had a bacteria that the 80% of non-responders who did not do well with cancer, didn't respond to their treatment, did not have. And that one bacteria that made the difference between whether you lived or died was Acromancia mucinophila. And in fact, what she did is she took the Acromancia from her cancer patients who did respond, went back to the lab, and she actually uh, implanted the human bacteria into lab mice, implanted a tumor on it, and gave them uh, 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 immunotherapy and show that if they had that bacteria, the tumors would actually shrink. And when she gave the mouse antibiotics that killed that bacteria, tumor didn't respond anymore. Powerful. And so I walked away from that conference, really my jaw on the ground. And so that's what I wrote about in Eat to Beat Disease. I've been talking about this since 2017. And I, I'm so happy that people are beginning to really um, crystallize around the research and the new findings that uh, acromancia is important, but it's just one of many different bacteria that we're beginning to, uh, to, to discover. So for that one specifically, it is powerful. And, and other than the, the, the choice of taking a supplement, how can we get acromancia naturally? What are, your, what are some of your favorite food sources? Yeah, so this is what's interesting. Remember I told you there's the first name acromancia and the last name eucinophila? Well, the thing is that you, if you help your gut secrete naturally more mucus, you create more soil for this bacteria to naturally thrive in. It's like putting more topsoil. Mucus is like topsoil in your garden. So you have more flowers that can actually bloom. Okay. And so how do you create more mucus in your gut? There's a way, scientific way of doing it. It turns out that certain kinds of polyphenols the lagitannins will actually help your gut, prompt your gut to secrete more mucus. So what are some of the common foods that we might eat? Pomegranate. Turns out pomegranate and pomegranate juice actually contains elagitannins. You can actually cause your gut to secrete more mucus and you can grow more acromancia. This has actually been shown in the lab uh, how to do it. And I actually uh, treated patients using this as well, before, cancer patients before they get immunotherapy. And, and the, you, should, you should see the response is really quite dramatic. Um, second, cranberry juice. Cranberry juice also um, can prompt your gut to secrete mucus. Now, real true cranberry juice is pretty tart, pretty hard to, to swig down, right? Um, uh, so I would caution about that because, you know, all the pomegranate juice is pretty sweet and you probably don't want to have too much of it. So the do food dose is important when you're doing food as medicine. I would say for pomegranate juice, because of how much sugar is actually in it, it's so sweet, just like an eight ounce cup. It's two shot glasses worth is enough to get your mucus kind of flowing in your gut. Um, pomegranate juice, the problem is if you want to add enough sugar to make it palatable, now you're adding sugar. So, you know, like that's why commercial cranberry juices are tough health sell to me, except that you can always find ones that are actually more natural. And that, I always gravitate towards those. And then the other one um, is Concord grape juice. Now, I don't know the reasons yet why it is Concord grape and not other grape, but Concord grape actually is a varietal grape that was grown in Massachusetts, um, and now it's grown all around the world. And you can actually buy Concord grapes, and that will also help your gut secrete mucus as well. So pomegranate juice, cranberry juice, Concord grape juice, they will actually naturally help your body grow more necromancia. Interesting. So for pomegranates, is it juice specifically, or could you just do a pure pomegranate or a pomegranate powder? Uh, or does it have to be the juice? You know, I think it's the elagitannins. Well, I know it's the elagitannins that actually have the effect. So, you know, people say, well, what about the supplement, the powder? What if you 
you know, probably that'll work as well. The research hasn't been done to compare things head to head, but it's, it's, it, you know, I think that you can have juice, you can have the whole pomegranate seed. Here's the thing though. If you were to, I, I love pomegranate seeds, you know, you can put them on a salad, you could cook with them, sprinkle them on, but you know, you'd have to eat a lot of seeds to actually get it, the amount you actually have in a, in an eight ounce cup of juice. You, you mentioned the, the, the car. And so I'm going to segue to the plane because you had a Instagram reel about what you would, I think it was what you would never touch on an airplane, <laughs> which went viral. I think we covered it. And a lot of people are traveling. I got to get on a plane again in a couple of weeks. And so let's, let's go there in closing. Let, let's, for people traveling, what do we need to stay away from on an airplane? I think I had five things I would never do, but the one thing, and, and thank you for reminding me, cause I've got to get on a plane as well uh, uh, in a few days. I said, I would not actually drink the coffee um, uh, because the water in airplanes comes from a tank that doesn't get cleaned between flights. In fact, maybe gets cleaned once or twice a year. And, and think about that. If you actually just drank from a well, you know, I mean, not a, not a clean well, a, a metal tank that only was cleaned maybe once or twice a year. That's where your coffee comes from. That's where the hot water for your tea comes from. You know what? It's just one of those things where have it before you get on the plane, have it after you get on the plane, uh, but don't have it while you're on the plane. That was the one that stood out to me as well, because I often, I always try to get the first flight in the morning. Uh, no matter where I am, usually the first flight gets out without a delay. And so, you know, then coffee is 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 whatever the, the coffee shop in the airport open in time. And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's you're you're getting on the plane and it's I'll take that coffee. And now it's no, no, no. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling your pain though. But you know, we want but we but you know, for those of us who like coffee, and by the way, coffee contains something called chlorogenic acid that also lights up your metabolism as well as your health defenses. Um the, the thing about that, though, is that uh, for me, practically, after, you know, with the more I dug into this, before you leave the house, make yourself a cup of coffee the way you like it, you know, swig it down. And, you know, it's, it, I think it's a habit that we sort of want to sip coffee all for, for hours. Uh, it, it, it have a new habit on a plane when you get on in the morning. <laughs> Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Uh, eat to beat your diet. Another bestseller for sure. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I hope people really en enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed writing it. I think that it, it really is a true sequel. And so people have actually said, you know, like, um, how do you describe this book coming off of a New York Times bestselling first book? I said, well, you know what? The bar got raised for me to do something that was even bigger and better and deeper and more mind blowing. And so I said, like, if my first book was Star Wars, this one would be The Empire Strikes Back. And I hope people watch it that way. <laughs> well said. Thank you so much. Thank you.